All right. Today is Monday, February 8th, and this is a recap and an analysis for the stock market activities today. At the end of last week, I issued this tweet explaining how the money flowed into the stock market throughout last week. In the beginning of the week, we saw inflows targeting the NASDAQ, specifically big technology names. And as we progressed throughout the week, we saw massive gains in the tech sector and names started to get bloated and back to all time highs once again the question was where will the money flow into next and my guess was the iwm small caps specifically the reopening names and we saw that exactly happens on thursday friday and today we witnessed the continuation of that particular theme. But the question I left you with is, are we going to see the laggards from last week catching a bid as well? And specifically, I gave out the SMH, the semiconductor sector, as an example. What do you know? Today we saw inflow into the SMH, which managed to close the day with gains over 3%. We saw significant gains in individual names such as NVIDIA, AMD, Micron, Texas Instruments, etc. So what is the market doing right now? What are institutional investors looking to do? Because the market is acting in a very weird fashion that is usually typical to what I call a blow off top move where the market rallies impulsively higher and you see one sector of the market being bloated and then the money rotates to other sectors that are lagging back and forth, back and forth. I call it the yo-yo game. However, if you go back to your childhood, you probably remember this game. And the objective, of course, as you start building one side of the screen and the puzzles start to rack up on top of each other, you start to find other areas in the screen that are not filled and you try to fill them until you find an alignment which will push the stack down once again. And you continue to build on and build on until you face the inevitable. What is the inevitable? Game over. This is exactly what's going on with the market right now. They pumped the queues and technology names rallied significantly higher to all time highs. Now they're looking for quote unquote lagging names, value names to push higher. They found it in the IWM and the reopening names. And now the IWM is trading at all time highs and the reopening names, some of them already trading above their pre-pandemic levels. And of course, they noticed that they forgot to pump the SMH last week. And today we saw chips catching a bit. And when that bloats up, they're going to rotate somewhere else, perhaps to the healthcare sector until every single sector of the market becomes very bloated, very overheated, and the whole thing blows up. We will not discuss the whole Reddit trade. I think it is very clear now that the rebellion has been defeated. Names like GameStop, AMC, COS, the battleground names continue to decline significantly while we see stabilization in the hedge funds' favorite names after massive gains last week. But this is the trade that we are watching right now. Remember the whole rotation trade that we tracked in this channel back in September? We're not going to do that again because the rotation has already happened. And there is no outflow versus inflow when we talk about a rotation from the so-called stay-at-home names to the reopening names. Instead, we will track the same trade by calling them the nostalgia stocks. Market participants are now looking for quote-unquote pockets of value and the thinking is that we are making significant process in vaccination. Cases are going down dramatically and we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. These are the names that got hit hard and impacted the most by the closures of the pandemic. Some of these stocks have already recovered their pre- pandemic levels due to the rotation trade that started to take place during September of last year and beyond. But there are some names that continue to lag and have not recovered their pre-pandemic levels. Of course, AMC is an exception here. It is involved in the battleground stocks, so we're not focusing on this name particularly. Let the whole battle passes 
and the stock collapses back to where it was before the whole Reddit mania started, and then we'll take it from there. But the point I'm trying to illustrate for you is that the search for the quote-unquote new momentum continues, and we saw the theme starting last week, and it is continuing to pick up at least from today's activities. If you continue to see that the nostalgia names are witnessing inflows tomorrow, and we are seeing somewhat of a momentum starting to build up in these names once again we will track their daily performances in future videos but you have to keep in mind that this is the current market dynamics in this video we will cover the usual in addition to the news of the day that tesla bought bitcoin we will discuss that in details what are the implications for tesla versus the implications for bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. We will also discuss another theme that is going on in the market. We discuss the nostalgia names. We will discuss the inflationary names. As inflation expectations continue to rise higher and we see the 10-year treasury yield picking up higher and higher every day, we're seeing a certain theme in the market. And that theme could intensify in the next few months if we continue to see inflation rising higher. So we'll show you how to capitalize on that particular trade. I will give you specific stocks that will benefit from the rise in inflation. We will also discuss the current long-term trajectory for the US dollar, which I believe will be lower, and which stocks, which areas of the market will benefit from a decline in the US dollar. And then stick around for the conclusion of the video, because I will discuss the current risks for the market and where we are in the cycle and what should we prepare for as we continue to march forward in February and March, is what we're seeing in the market right now an indication of a last hurrah type of rally that will be followed by a severe correction, just like we saw last year in the aftermath of the massive blow off top rally in August. And with that being said, we do have a market to cover, and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 237.52 points, or a gain of 0.76%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 131.35 points, or a gain of 0.95%. The S&P 500 in the green by 28.76 points, or a gain of 0.74%. What about the sector's performance? For the day, leading the pack, energy, capturing the gold medal, and for the second place, and the silver medal, basic materials, for the third place, capturing the bronze, technology. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day, led by utilities, consumer cyclicals, and communication services. The major theme today is we saw a decline in the US dollar once again. That is all very good for energy and materials. Yields continue to rise higher, but they closed below the highs of the day. And we will continue to track where treasury yields will lead us next. Shifting to the futures market performance for the day, starting with crude oil. We saw significant gains in crude, the WTI closing almost 2% in the upside. What about softs? The gainers led by lumber, cotton, OJ. Meanwhile, the laggards and softs futures led by sugar, coca, and coffee, all closing in the red. What about metals? Excellent day for metals. You know what happened. The dollar index goes down. Metals trade higher. Platinum. Leading the pack, followed by silver, gold, copper, and palladium. What's going on with meats? The gains go on for lean hogs. Meanwhile, feeder cattle, closing in the red, declines of a little above half a percentage point. What about grains? We talked about grains last week. And I said they're taking a pause only to revitalize the rally. And this is exactly what we saw today. Corn futures leading the pack with almost 3% gains for the session, followed by wheat, soybean oil, oats, soybean, soybean meal futures, and canola. Meanwhile, the only lagging futures in grains are rough rice futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. Let's see what happened today. Leading the pack at number one 
Check this name out. Exxon Mobil. With a little over 1.1 million contracts traded today, about 93% of those were calls. Coming up, number two, Apple. With a little over 1 million contracts traded today, about 71% of those were calls. What about Tesla at number three? We saw the volume of options receding once again. The pending news was about Tesla buying Bitcoin. Exciting for Bitcoin, not so much for Tesla. At least, this is what options traders are saying today. We saw a little over 670,000 contracts traded today for Tesla. About 63% of those were calls. And what about the unusual trades that took place in the options market today? We have a few, starting with the ticker RSX. This is for the Russian ETF. Very unusual trade. They're buying the 27 calls expiration date March 19th, with expectation that the Russian ETF will rally over 6.5% percent by then and they are paying about 30 cents a piece to enter this trade that brings the total to about 1.2 million dollars what about the trade for amd they're buying the 99 calls expiration date february 26 with expectation that the name is going to rally over eight percent by then and they are paying about a buck and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade and that brings the total all the way to three and a half million dollars. What about the ticker LI? This is for Lee Odo. Somebody's buying the 32 calls expiration date this upcoming Friday with expectation that the name is going to rally over five and a half percent by then. And they are paying about 40 cents a piece to enter the trade. And that brings the total all the way to half a million dollars. And here is the last trade of the day perhaps the most significant one for the ticker PNN. This is for Penn National Gaming. Somebody's buying the 140 calls expiration date April 16th and they are paying about nine bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade. That brings the total all the way to about nine and a half million dollars. Of course the expectation here is that Penn National Gaming would rally over 15 and a half percent by the expiration date of April 16th. Moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with macro news. I will continue to hear more information every single day about the upcoming round of stimulus, which will also include a hike in minimum wages. And we heard from the Congressional Budget Office, this is a nonpartisan organization. And here it is, the Congressional Budget Office predicts increasing the federal minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour would increase the federal budget deficit by 54 billion between 2021 and 2031. They also predict the 900,000 people would be lifted out of poverty while 1.4 million jobs will be eliminated. Now, while we all have concerns regarding inflation, we have witnessed an increase in grains Prices, for example, corn futures, canola futures, in raw materials such as copper, iron, nickel, in everyday products, milk, orange juice, coffee, etc. Inflation is all around us. And now we know that oil prices are also joining the inflationary environment. If you doubt that there is inflation around you, next time you go to the grocery store, watch out for the bill. Watch out for the prices going higher and higher every time you shop. It is no secret that inflation in particular, food prices has caused a hunger crisis in the United States of America, the richest country in the world. And we have a hunger crisis due to the massive surge of food prices. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve continues to ignore the reality, rejecting the notion that we have inflation all around us because they're using their own formulas outdated models to calculate inflation. The biggest concern for the Federal Reserve regarding inflation is wages. Surprise, surprise. They have no problem creating asset bubbles in equity markets or the real estate market or in food prices, oil prices. That doesn't matter to them. But when inflation catches up to your wages or you finally start to see your wages going higher, God forbid they have to tackle inflation. And this kind of behavior 
year will lead us, by the way, to a phenomenon called stagflation that we have not seen since the 1970s. But that is a discussion for another video. For now, my criticism is for the Congressional Budget Office. They have all of these concerns that increasing the minimum wage will add 54 billion to the deficit between 21 to 31. Was the Congressional Budget Office asleep when we added trillions and trillions of dollars in budget deficit just to save Wall Street? And I also reject the notion that hiking the minimum wage to a livable one, now we could argue whether hiking the wage, the minimum wage that is, to 15 bucks an hour in Mississippi is a smart move or not because California versus Mississippi, in California, it makes sense to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Mississippi is a different story. But the point is, they're doing all of these studies to pretty much send the message to the Biden administration that hiking the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour is excessive and will overheat the economy in addition to not delivering the end goals. I call bullshit. You're not going to fire your employees if you're a corporation once the minimum wage gets hiked to 15 bucks an hour. You will pass that cost to the customer. This is how inflation works. Certain businesses will not be able to do that, specifically small businesses. But do we even have any small businesses left after the destruction that was engineered by the government during the COVID shutdowns. Furthermore, absent from this type of study is the impact and the cost of welfare to these minimum wage employees. Most of them earn less than the poverty rate and they have to apply and qualify for multiple programs of welfare that end up costing the government a lot more than hiking the minimum wage. We can manage an increase of the minimum wage by countering that with certain tax cuts for small businesses to absorb the additional cost. But once again, they release these numbers without calculating the cost of welfare because somebody earning eight bucks an hour working in a fast food restaurant or Walmart, these employees are also applying for welfare and that cost the government and the taxpayer billions and billions of dollars every single year. It's better off to pay these people a living wage and have them stand up on their feet without relying on the federal government welfare programs. And you know what? If the corporations are going to cry, cry me a river. You made a killing in the stock market last year. You raised significant amount of cash from the Federal Reserve and the lending facilities and the free money. It is time to contribute your fair share in holding and recovering this economy. Enough said. We're moving on. But we're still in macro news. And here it is. Democrats to unveil one-year plan to send up to 3600 per child to households. And while there is a disagreement regarding the number, we have an agreement even from Republican politicians the like of Mitt Romney regarding this plan. And once again, we continue to rack in more debt, more budget deficit, which will lead to more inflation, which will hurt households at the end of the day. What is the point of handing people free money when that will cause inflation which will reduce their purchasing power and will hike all the bills and the living costs that they have to face. How about we concentrate on the vaccination efforts so we can reopen the economy faster, hike the minimum wage to a reasonable level, and make sure that people can stand up on their own. Now in certain cases, the wealth gap has become very, very extreme and you'll have a certain percentage of the population that needs welfare programs to sustain the living situations and recover from the economic damage of COVID-19. But this is what's dictating the movement in the market right now. The more details we get about the next round of stimulus, what is included, what is not included, you will see volatility in the movement of the US dollar and the 10-year treasury yield, which will impact the movement of the sectors in the stock market. We also got news regarding the trade deficit, and here it is. The U.S. officially posted its largest annual trade deficit since 2008. This is, of course, for last year, 2020. The gap widened to $678.7 billion from $576.9 billion in the prior year. Moving on to market sentiment news, and of course, 
We're all aware about the Dogecoin mania. We heard from Elon Musk. That created a ripple effect that led us to hear from celebrities, athletes, rappers, etc. And here is the impact. After a series of tweets from Tesla's Elon Musk and rapper Snoop Dogg, the cryptocurrency Dogecoin top 10 billion dollars in market value 10 billion dollars for a parody this is the power of uh, scam artists online who call themselves influencers such as elon musk and the likes and of course an illustration of the power of dumb money ask yourself a question do we need another round of stimulus adding more debt to the already humongous amount that we have once again certain segments in our society who are waiting in food lines and suffering from the hunger crisis, those people deserve the stimulus. However, using the helicopter money to spread the stimulus all over the country is a big mistake and it is not needed. These people who are gambling on Dogecoin don't need another round of stimulus. The Dogecoin mania is an illustration and a proof that we already have excess stimulus in the economy. I hate to agree with the snake Larry Summers, but he is right. If we spread another round of stimulus, billions of dollars, into the pockets of people who don't need it, that money will find its way in the stock market and in the options gambling mania. And all in all, it will end up overheating the markets, overheating the economy. And when people lose their money, that money will be transferred to who? Market makers in Wall Street. The likes of Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. It is in essence a transfer of wealth from the taxpayer to Wall Street's biggest corporations and banks. Continuing in market sentiment news, and here it is, yet another sign of the excesses in the market. EV company Blink has never posted profit in its 11-year history, but investors have bid its stock up 3,000% over the past eight months. Once again, they're naive investors. They don't read balance sheets. They don't read anything. All they need to have is a ticker. You give them a ticker and you just sell them a story that, oh, this company will be the next Tesla. This company will be the next whatever. And they continue to buy, buy, buy because they're not aware of a very critical thing called valuations. We don't teach valuations in high school and colleges. So the new generation of investors is fixated on the stock price. They think going from 40 bucks to 100 bucks to 300 bucks is just how the market usually acts. They're not aware the stock price reflects a certain valuation and you cannot jump from one price level to the other without raising the valuation of that particular company. To justify the valuation at any level, you have to look at the company's financial results, the revenue, the profit, the cash flow, the balance sheet to justify where the company is trading from a market cap level, not from a number next to the price. Moral of the story is, once this crash is over and the retail side gets slaughtered, we need to redo our education system and include more financial classes, more valuation classes in high school and colleges. And here is more in sentiment news and an illustration of the current mania in the market. The number of stocks with daily volume of more than twice their market value, and this goes all the way back to November 1998 to January 2021. We have reached all time highs. We are trading more stock volume than the actual value of the underlying company. Yet these are the same quote unquote investors who keep telling me that shorts are stupid for shorting over 120% of GameStop stock float. Meanwhile, they're the same people trading more volume than the actual value of the underlying stock. And while the Federal Reserve continues to play poker, telling us that they're not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising rates, the alarm sound is ringing everywhere. And here is from Citibank. Citi's Matt King highlights the key issue for the Fed right now as it explicitly pushes up asset prices. Quote unquote, when failing short on your inflation and employment benchmarks, does creating asset price bubbles improve your chances of hitting your targets or detract from them? Bravo. This is the point that we've been saying all along in this channel. And finally, 
Wall Street banks are starting to catch up to what we have been saying all along. The Federal Reserve says that their mandate is to control inflation and to help managing unemployment. But their true mandate is to prop up and inflate the assets of the wealthy, stocks and real estate. Tell me how inflating this bubble further and further will somehow magically recover the employment picture in America. Tell me how raising inflation all over the economy will somehow magically recover employment in this country. If anything, it will make it harder for employment to recover. And you saw the abysmal numbers that we got in the month of January. The majority of jobs created were in government sectors, meaning that all of this free money, that tsunami of liquidity is going to share buybacks and corporate bonuses. It is not trickling down to creating jobs. It is time for the Fed to wake up, but in reality, it's time for us to wake up because the Federal Reserve is very much aware with what they're doing, and they're doing it intentionally because this is their main purpose. But what about the American population? Are we aware of what's going on with the Federal Reserve? Are we going to stand up and say enough? All of what you're doing is racking more debt for the future generation to deal with Meanwhile, you're not doing anything, Ogats, to help recovering the employment picture in this country. You think we're smart enough to do that? Of course not. We are a zombified society between the Xanax, the Adderall, the Prozac, and the Oxy. Most of our brain cells have been already erased, and our critical thinking ability is limited to memes and emojis. Oh, and by the way, what about the Fed's argument that the current P.E. ratios in the market, the excessive elevated all-time highs, P.E. ratios in the market don't matter because of what? Because of the low 10-year Treasury yield and the spread across the yield curve. Well, that argument is going down the toilet as we speak, here it is, spread between the S&P 500 earnings yield and the 10-year Treasury yield continuing to collapse, now at the lowest since October 2018. You see that spike on the chart? That was the opportunity to buy the stock market because it was a no-brainer. Tina was alive back then. Tina is now dead and she was killed by the imbecile decisions of Jerome Powell. There is no Tina here. There is no argument to say, oh yeah, let's tolerate the insane valuations in the stock market because the spread between the S&P 500 yields versus the Treasury yields are wide. We're now back to where we were in 2018. And we all remember the kind of tantrum we experienced in the market back then. And what about the so-called reopening trade or the reinflationary trade that we're about to discuss in a little bit? Even those names are heavily bloated right now and they are starting to form a threat underneath the stock market. Here it is. Great reflation trade brings new threats to record stock rally. For the first time in a long time, there is a conversation on Wall Street about when equities might start to feel the heat from reflation signals in the bond market, powered by a rally in oil and bets on further U.S. stimulus. Market-derived inflation expectations are near the highest since 2013. And here is more in market sentiment news. Remember our friend Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley. And uh, Mike Wilson is one of those analysts, and he is a brilliant analyst, by the way. But he is one of those guys who shows up in TV every year predicting that we're going to have a 10 to 15% correction every single year. And he would say, yeah, we'll have a 10 to 15% correction but we are in a bull market, so that would be a dip, an opportunity to buy. And when he's right, he's celebrated as somewhat of a genius, a messiah. And when he's wrong, nobody pays attention, except for now. Because he's been calling and calling for the 10 to 15% correction. And now he's a little embarrassed. So he decided to capitulate and totally give up on his prediction. Good morning, Will. I, I saw that various notes of late you, you were calling for a correction, which, which obviously we had. We had a bit of a pullback, but, but was that it? I mean, it, it was brief. It lasted a week or so, 4% peak to, to trough fall, and we're back at records again. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was brief. So if you blinked, you missed it. Uh, that, that looks like that was it for now. Um, I mean, the markets are, are quite uh, powerful at the moment. I mean, and it ha they have been, right? I mean, there's tremendous liquidity. 
there's a very uh, good and very understandable story behind the scenes, meaning we've got a, a strong economic recovery that's visible to everyone. The earnings season's been good so far. We heard about that this morning. And, and uh, people have bought into it. I, I guess what I would say is that, you know, uh, right now the markets are, I think, still in a bit of a fragile state, more, more fragile than people might think. Because people are involved, uh, there is still leverage in the system. It's not, you know, dangerous necessarily, and so we, we should expect these sort of three to five percent corrections at any moment. That's normal, uh, but yeah, the correction over the last couple of weeks is over. We made new highs, and, and the bull market is intact. And of course, Mike Wilson is saying that the correction is over, and the reason is that the retail investor is still involved in the market, and the retail investor continues to bid the market higher and that is all justified because here we go back at it again the federal reserve liquidity and low interest rates and here's what i said mike wilson of morgan stanley changed his mind now he says the correction is over buckle up your seat belts the correction is about to start and indeed it will mike wilson made a complete ass hat out of himself going back and forth back and forth changing his outlook and prediction in the market. Mike, either you're confident with your call or not. Stick to one call. Stop weaseling around back and forth, back and forth, talking with both sides of the mouth, saying that we're going to have a correction of 10 to 15 percent, or we're overvalued, etc., etc. Interest rates are rising higher. Meanwhile, with the other side, oh, but we are in a bull market. And if we go down, that would be a dip and an opportunity to buy. Aren't you sick of this bullshit? And I'm talking to you, the audience, right now. You turn on a YouTube channel and the guy shows you a chart. He does uh, technical analysis and they babble nothing but gibberish for about 20 to 30 minutes looking at two or three charts. And at the end of the video, you realize that the conclusion of everything this guy said is, oh, the market can go up or it can go down. Oh, golly gee, I did not know that before I watched your video. Aren't you sick of this bullshit? How about some confidence here, some consistency? Just tell us your opinion. Do the work, explain everything, and then tell us what you see. And this is what I do in this channel. Who give a rat's ass if I'm right or wrong, if somebody's gonna troll me, who cares? Who cares? At the end of the day, you see certain facts and you tell it like it is. You give people your honest opinion and outlook. If that set of facts change, for example, if corporate earnings skyrocket and all of a sudden the PE ratios, the forward PE ratios that is, decline significantly, then I'll tell you, hey, the market is bullish now. The valuations are reasonable. We're not in a bubble anymore. But so long as the facts are intact, the argument remains the same. Mike Wilson flip-flopping and losing a lot of credibility here. What a clown. Moving on to corporate-specific news, starting with Disney. Disney is reporting earnings this week. And what you're seeing so far is the donkey mentality. What is the donkey mentality, by the way? It is buying first, asking questions later. Matter of fact, don't ask questions at all. Put your blindfold on and buy, buy, buy. And this is exactly what's going on with Disney stock right now. They're buying the stock ahead of earnings, just like they did with Apple. And we know how that story ended. It's the same story with Amazon, Microsoft, etc. They buy before earnings and then they're surprised, oh, it didn't work. The stock went down or stayed flat and they're doing it via options. And the premiums are very, very elevated. And while market participants are participating in the donkey mentality, here is Disney chairman Bob Iger dumping about 30 million bucks or so worth of shares. Who do I trust here? Do I trust the donkeys chasing the price before the fact? Or do I trust the corporate insider who just dumped millions and millions of dollars worth of shares? How about wait for the earnings report and then make your decision to buy or not? But this is not about investing anymore. It is about gambling. It's a casino. They know that the name is about to report earnings and it could blast higher or lower. And they place the chips on the roulette table and they cross their fingers that they will hit the right number. Moving on to AMC, we know the mania that happened over there. It was an opportunity for multiple hedge funds and investment firms to dump their shares at massive, massive profits. And here it is. Wanda America, a unit of China's Dalian Wanda Group, did a conversion of shares for what? Because they're readying to dump their stake in AMC. Meanwhile, the geniuses over at TikTok, Reddit, 
And your idols, Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, Shamath, they're all telling you to hold the bag, diamond hands, while the Wanda group is about to take a massive dump on your diamond hands. What about this? Remember that we heard the news that Hyundai and Kia confirmed the fact that they will manufacture the iCar. However, today we got another confirmation. Hyundai and Kia are no longer in talks with Apple over autonomous EV. So the whole thing was just bullshit. I don't know who leaked the information or who decided to go with the information to the media. Was it the iMob, Apple executives? Or was it that CNBC reporter and professional bullshitter Phil LeBlue just making shit up to get some airtime? Of course, the man is a jackass. He gets trolled by Elon Musk. He gets trolled by Apple this time around. Just feed him whatever piece of news you want and he's gonna go live on air spreading the misinformation. I believe that somebody trolled Phil LeBleu. Yet you did not see a massive sell-off in Apple shares. The people who bought the stock last week, they continue to believe that the iCar will be manufactured by Hyundai or Kia, or if they're not manufactured by Hyundai or Kia, they will be manufactured by somebody else someday, somehow, and that is enough for us to hold the shares. Oh, and speaking of EVs, and we're talking about actual EVs in reality land, not in La La Land. How about the new Mustang Mach-E? Well, we have it, flesh, bone, tires, touchscreen, they're all there. Multiple news organizations managed to drive the car and we had more details about pricing, etc. And remember, Ford, still has a competitive advantage over Tesla and over General Motors because of the federal credits. They're still eligible. You can deduct about 7,500 bucks maximum when you buy a Ford EV versus Tesla and General Motors who already exhausted their credits. And by the way, according to the reviews, they're saying that this one is a serious competition to Tesla's vehicles. Matter of fact, they criticized the build quality for Tesla. And they said that Ford has the build quality that you expect from a name like Ford. Unlike the cheap Chinese cars Tesla is manufacturing. And of course, the difference here is Reverend Elon Musk likes to use cheap Chinese bolts. Meanwhile, Ford uses cheap Mexican bolts, which from my understanding are superior to the Chinese bolts. No love for American made bolts, even though they cost about two cents more. But speaking of Tesla, this is a good point for us to segue to the main event of the day. Here it is. Tesla invests 1.5 billion in Bitcoin and says it plans to accept the cryptocurrency as a form of payment, sending prices to a record. And we saw the reaction from Bitcoin reaching all-time highs. Meanwhile, the reaction in Tesla was muted. And by the way, we now know what caused the volatility in Tesla options on Friday. And here's how it works. You don't have to believe me. I'm just telling you how thing works. Somebody at the SEC who's getting paid by hedge funds, heard the news that Tesla has a new filing with the SEC. That person leaked the news to hedge funds and other Wall Streeters who bought puts expecting the news to be bad. This is how things work. And now we know that Tesla's buying Bitcoin and they're committing about 8% of their cash portfolio to buy Bitcoin, which is a very, very risky moved by Elon Musk and it will be criticized, scrutinized, specifically given the fact that Elon Musk has been busy pumping Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies the last few weeks. Meanwhile, he already started a position in Bitcoin, which is classic market manipulation 101. But we know that the SEC is in a coma. It is a dormant organization. And Elon Musk, of course, thinks that he is above the law, that he is a billionaire and he can do whatever he wants, engage in market manipulation whatsoever. And if he gets scrutinized and punished, he will cry foul. He will play the victim and point the finger. What about the shorts? What about the hedge funds? What about Wall Street? I'm just doing what they're doing. Tesla in a new filing, says that they've updated their investment policy to provide them with more flexibility to, are you ready for this, be able to buy Bitcoin. We have invested in aggregate $1.5 billion in Bitcoin, the company says, under this policy and may acquire and hold digital assets from time to time or longer term. Moreover, we expect to begin accepting Bitcoin 
as a form of payment for our products in the near future, the company says, subject to applicable laws and initially on a limited basis, we'll see what that means, which we may or may not liquidate upon receipt. That would be similar to what PayPal is doing in terms of how it transacts with merchants. This could be um, another, I mean, we're watching Bitcoin move up uh, on the back, I imagine, of this news. I don't know how quickly it's it's getting into the public... uh, Realm would, right now, I would just throw an extra point then to, to the discussion we were just having, which is, and we don't know this, but but uh, but it, there's an added irresponsibility to push up a stock if you're also benefiting from it. I, I don't know if Dogecoin was one that Tesla bought, but uh, there's definitely a correlation effect with the bitcoins of, of this world. And uh, it, I'd have to go back through all of his tweets, but maybe Musk has also tweeted to push up the price of Bitcoin in, in the last couple of months. But well, he, he was. He, he was in the, just a few weeks ago. In fact, he had Bitcoin. He had added the right. symbol to his, his profile. On- that this is another form of market manipulation. And this is someone who, who's had clashes with the SEC before and had restrictions on his tweets imposed on him before. I want to know what every single Tesla board member thinks uh, about this. They presumably had to vote to approve this uh, decision because right. the, the filing says... Uh, that, you know, they had to change the rules to allow them to have more flexibility uh, on their cash. And of course, the question here is, what are the implications of this very reckless decision by Elon Musk to commit about 8% of the company's cash position to buy Bitcoin instead of building a moat for Tesla to survive the competition. Maybe it is. You think Tesla board members asking themselves today, maybe boss officially lost his mind? I mean, it is one thing that the man is staying up all night, tweeting memes, and then waking up in the afternoon, showing up late at work, not getting any vitamin D, eating junk food, that's his personal business. But when Reverend Elon is now gambling with the company's cash, that is a different problem. And by the way, in the short term, that could actually be good for Tesla shares, meaning he will continue to pump Bitcoin online and perhaps we will wake up tomorrow and we will see Bitcoin trading at 50 grand. You will see that Tesla's investment is appreciating and everybody will applaud this move. But what happens if trading in Bitcoin becomes more volatile and we see a drop? of 10, 20, 30 percent. That will hurt Tesla shares and it will shake the confidence in the company and the management, specifically Reverend Elon Musk. The man has completely and officially lost his mind. And speaking of mind, here it is. Elon Musk says his startup Neuralink has wired up a monkey to play video games using its mind. Neuralink put a computer chip into a monkey's skull and used tiny wires to connect it to its brain, Musk said. Maybe Reverend Elon needs a new chip in his own brain because the current one is clearly malfunctioning. And by the way, to all the Tesla culties and the greenies who keep telling me that Elon is saving the world and we are for the environment, you're the conscious people, you know, the woke people who like to point the finger at everybody else how do you feel about elon musk experimenting on a monkey playing with his brain isn't this animal cruelty but this is the cult mentality they know it's wrong if anyone else does it there will be outrage but because it is their cult leader doing it oh but 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 you don't understand but 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 it's better for humanity but 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 the monkey's happy really you talk to the monkey you know he's happy this is exactly the dangers of cults. And Tesla has bigger problems to worry about. Meanwhile, Elon is gambling on Bitcoin. Here it is. Chinese market regulator, government departments held meeting with Tesla over quality issues. The meeting was called in response to growing reports of consumers about battery fires, unexpected acceleration, and over-the-air update failure. Furthermore, four Chinese regulators meet with Tesla, urge the company to operate according to China law. Of course, the Chinese invited Elon to open a factory in Shanghai, and they took him down like a donkey. They bugged the factory, the Chinese intelligence service, bugged the factory, stole the technology and all the intellectual property, and they gave it to who? Chinese competitors. And now the Chinese competitors have mastered the game. We're talking about Neo, Xpeng, Li Odo, etc. Do they need Tesla anymore? He was more. Former Wall Street analyst and money manager Gary Black has exited his Tesla position, saying he's looking for a better entry point down the road. And this is the same investor who said the Tesla stock will be trading at 1,000. But the news from today is rattling confidence in this company 
and in Reverend Elon Musk personally, you will see more exits from Tesla investors, specifically if we see massive volatility in Bitcoin prices. It's one thing to hold a stock at reasonable valuation while the CEO is playing games and gambling because what is the worst case scenario? The company is already reasonably valued. We might have a sell-off, but we are reasonably valued and I can hold through the storm. It's a different story when the company is already overvalued severely and then you have the CEO completely losing his mind, acting erratically all over the place. This will shake the confidence in Elon Musk and Tesla. And by the way, let's talk about Bitcoin itself, because while we might see negative impacts to Tesla itself, this news is very good for Bitcoin and cryptos in general. Why is that? Number one, it puts them on the spot and that spot is positive. It was one of the largest companies in the world, giving a vote of confidence to Bitcoin not only that, but also announcing that they will accept cryptocurrencies, in this case, Bitcoin as a form of payment. Here is what I see for Bitcoin from a technical aspect. And we can go over the chart if you'd like. Let me know. We'll go over it. We have a crossing in the MACD and that was your signal to buy Bitcoin. And it is technically bullish. However, there are concerns for the long term regarding Bitcoin. Let's start with what's going on right for Bitcoin. Number one, the supply and demand. There's more demand, there's more euphoria and mania in Bitcoin, and that would push the price higher. Number two, you have the psychology now. When we see a big corporation like Tesla announcing they're buying Bitcoin and you're seeing the price rising higher and higher every day, those outlandish predictions that Bitcoin will be trading at 300,000 or perhaps half a million at some point become more and more realistic and that has a psychological part in attracting more inflows for Bitcoin. But what are the concerns here? Number one, we don't have a proven track record that Bitcoin can withstand market volatility and inflation like gold, for example, even though Bitcoin is touted as the digital gold. For now, we don't have a proof whether Bitcoin will be able to withstand the risk of inflation or market volatility. Furthermore, we have the lack of utility. The utility of using Bitcoin is very, very limited for now. That might be expanded in the future. And if Tesla is serious about their commitment of using Bitcoin as an acceptable form of payment to purchase Tesla vehicles, that would expand the utility of Bitcoin. And the last concern here is competition. For example, even if we figure out the utility, say I'm the CEO of Sony, this is a digital currency. We know the billions of dollars are being spent in the PlayStation store of gamers buying cheat codes, skins, items to use in the video game itself. Is there a better, more suitable utility for Bitcoin than using it in the video game world, that would be a very good start to build up the credibility for Bitcoin as a legitimate digital currency. However, once again, if I am the CEO of Sony, why would I go with Bitcoin? Why not just create Sony coin or PlayStation coin, a new digital currency that can be traded and actually has utility within the PlayStation ecosystem? And that is a major concern for Bitcoin. That even if we figure out utility for cryptocurrencies, we're still facing the risk of competition. That everybody wants to start their own coin and trade it. And that creates a cannibalization effect in the crypto market. Moving on to the heat map analysis and let's see what happened today. Once again, we see inflow where the dollar sensitive names, the dollar declines, materials and energy names outperform. Likewise, they're chasing lagging names from last week. You see an outperformance for what? Semiconductor names. Massive gains for Taiwan, Nvidia rising up from the dead, up over 6% today, AMD, Micron, you name it. They're all trading significantly higher and the SMH is catching up with the move in the broader NASDAQ. We also saw the continuation of the theme from last week of chasing the reopening names and the IWM. Furthermore, we're seeing the quote unquote inflationary trade being rewarded. And for that, let's segue to the next segment of discussing inflation and how to capitalize if we witness a continuation in the rise of inflation. But first, let's discuss why would inflation rise in the current state of this economy? There are several reasons that cause the rise of inflation. 
And by the way, this is not some uh, asshole college professor with a bow tie and glasses teaching you macro classes. This is the maverick way, simplifying things and using the common man language. And I'm not a dummy either. I studied macroeconomics and finance, and then I went to grad school and I got my MBA. So I know what I'm talking about. I'm just simplifying things for you. And I'm cutting out the fat and the bullshit out of the explanation. Inflation could rise due to demand pull inflation, the rise of demand in the economy. And of course, the pandemic has changed everything we know about macroeconomics because while we saw a slowdown in economic activities due to the lockdowns from the virus, somehow we shifted our consumption online, keeping the demand in the economy pretty much intact. Matter of fact, we saw a surge of demand on certain items in certain sectors of the economy. Furthermore, the lockdowns led to a massive surge in personal savings. All of that saving has to be released and deployed in the economy once we're vaccinated and we have an official normalization of the economy. That in itself will lead to a rise of inflation because you will see a tsunami of the saved money, whether it is from stimulus all legitimate saving, you will see the resumption of using credit cards, and you're not going to see that happening gradually. It's built up demand that is about to be released in the economy that will lead to a rise in inflation. Here is the second reason inflation goes higher. Supply push inflation. That happens when commodity prices rise higher for whatever reason. For example, in the 70s, we saw the oil embargo Oil prices rose higher and in turn that led to a rise in inflation. What are we seeing right now? We're seeing oil prices surging higher. We're seeing grain prices trading impulsively higher. Whether you're talking about soybeans, corn, wheat, canola, they're all surging and skyrocketing significantly. The prices of lumber skyrocketing impulsively and each commodity has a unique circumstance on why it is rising, but they are all related to what? The COVID-19 crisis, which is changing our understanding of how macroeconomics work. In addition to the decline of the US dollar, and you're seeing metal prices also rising higher, whether you're talking about copper, gold, silver, etc. Meaning that the input prices in the economy surged higher, that in itself is causing supply push inflation. Look no further to the housing market. The rise in the prices of lumber, which came in hand in hand with the rise in demand of home purchasing due to the low mortgage rates and the pandemic environment. Those lumber prices might come down at some point if the demand eases. However, the damage has been already done. Housing prices are in a bubble. The inflation is already here. Similarly, when we talk about grains or lean hogs, the shutdowns of factories and farms due to the virus add pressure on supply that causes the demand to skyrocket higher. And the uneven recovery across the globe where you have China and other Asian countries recovering faster and managing the virus much better than the United States or Western countries. The demand for grains and lean hogs in China is skyrocketing. Meanwhile, the supply for these commodities, which happen to come from America or Russia, Brazil, the supply is under constraint. And that is leading for the skyrocketing prices of grains and meats. What about the third reason? Money supply. Do I have to explain this for you? Take a look at M1 money supply to the moon. How about M2 money supply to the moon too? What is the difference between M1 and M2? M1 is a little narrow in scope. It measures tangible cash, checks, etc. circling in the economy. Meanwhile, M2 is a little broader in definition because it includes stocks and bonds and other intangible assets. The Fed ushered the tsunami of liquidity. Expect inflation to rise higher. But it's always been historically the case. But here is the other factor, the velocity of money. You could look at the money supply chart and you would say, why are we not experiencing the highest inflation in history? Because money supply surged significantly in parabolic moves. The reason is the velocity of money. The velocity of money is basically how fast is that money supply exchanging hands in the economy? Well, we are in a shutdown, so the velocity of money has dropped significantly. And that's the only thing keeping the money supply 
from translating into inflation in the economy. Once we're vaccinated and we reopen the economy, we normalize the economy, the velocity of money will start to pick up and rise higher and higher significantly and impulsively, which will lead to a massive surge in inflation. Here's the other thing, inflation expectations. Here's the chart for inflation expectations rising significantly higher breaking a descending downward trend for years and years. This is the first time we're seeing inflation expectation rising in an upward trend. And the reason is, if you believe that inflation will rise higher the next day, the next week, the next month, you will do your spending right now to take advantage of cheaper prices. That in itself is inflationary in nature. What about stimulus and taxes? Well, we have trillions of dollars worth of stimulus. That's going to go into people's hands, corporations, the money supply will go higher, and that acts as inflationary pressure in the economy. Furthermore, what happens when we raise taxes? We have more government revenue, and that revenue gets spent in the economy, leading to more inflation. Higher taxes is inflationary in nature. What about the last factor here? Wages. We will hike the minimum wage regardless of which number we're going to settle at at the end of the day. 15, 11, 12, it doesn't matter. The minimum wage is going higher. When the minimum wage is higher, people have more money. They spend that money in the economy, creating demand, pull inflation, and that leads to higher inflation overall. So are we in a perfect storm for inflation or what? Now, how do we capitalize on higher inflation in the stock market? Which stocks will outperform and which stocks will underperform? Here it is. This is my list. And here is the disclaimer. Don't take these names and what you see on the screen right now as the gospel. Do your own homework. You might disagree with my picks. You might find other picks. What I'm trying to tell you here is this is my opinion and my view. You could have a different one, so do your own homework. But make no mistake, high inflation will benefit financial stocks that rely on higher dividend yields. Furthermore, higher inflation will lead to higher wages. Higher wages lead to more spending in the economy, specifically retail businesses and the likes. Higher inflation also helps commodity prices to rise higher. So we're looking for names that are related to commodity prices and have pricing power where they can shift the increase in input prices to the end customer. And here are the names that I have for you. JP Morgan Chase, US Bank Corp. These are two names that will benefit from the rise in the 10-year treasury yield. I do have WP Carry for you, and this is a representation of the real estate sector, which benefits under inflation because the asset prices, the underlying asset prices for real estate surge higher, hand-in-hand -hand with higher inflation. Furthermore, they have pricing power. They can increase rent anytime they want. People have higher wages. They will have no choice but to pay the rent. What about United Health Group? Higher inflation will lead to higher demand. Higher demand leads to higher employment, a recovery in the employment picture in the economy. More employees will need more health insurance plans. All of that is good for United Health. What about MasterCard and American Express? We will see a surge in spending. That spending will lead to higher usage of credit cards, more spending on travel. These two names will benefit tremendously, let alone the benefit that they will capture from higher rates. What about Walmart? Higher inflation leads to higher wages, more spending. Walmart benefits. So will TJ Maxx. You gotta buy more clothes. You need clothes for work. You need clothes for going out, etc, etc. What about CarMax? The rise of inflation will lead to higher financing costs for auto manufacturers, specifically for new cars. In addition to the shortage in chips, that will lead to a surge in new car prices. Even though we will see higher employment and higher wages, it would not make any sense financing a new car. So we will see the continuation of demand on used cars. CarMax benefits tremendously. What about New Mount? This is a representative of gold. Gold thrives under high inflation. What about waste management? Higher inflation, higher spending, higher economic activities will lead to more waste, more garbage, more business for waste management. What about Kroger? Similar story. Higher inflation will lead to higher input prices. All of the items in the grocery store 
will go higher. Meanwhile, the demand will remain the same. People will have higher wages, slightly, but they're not going to starve to death. They still have to go to the grocery store and buy food and items, meaning the Kroger has the pricing power to pass the increase in cost to the end customer. What about Westra? More economic activity, more need for shipping, packaging, etc. That would help Westra stock tremendously. What about Chevron? Chevron is suffering right now, but oil prices are recovering. Higher inflation, higher oil prices, more normalization of the economy, more traveling. That is all good for Chevron. What about UPS? Similar story. If you have inflation, you have an uptick of economic activity. And they have the pricing power to jack up prices. And what will the end customer do? They have no choice but to pay the higher price. What about Martin Moretta? Higher inflation leads to higher commodity prices. Martin Moretta will have the government increasing spending, doing more infrastructure projects to capture the low interest rates before they go higher and higher. Martin Moretta can pass the cost and overcharge the government, and you know our dummy government will pay for it anyways. What about Alcoa? Once again, commodity prices rising higher, but more demand, more economic activity. They can pass the cost to the end customer, no problem whatsoever. And the rise of raw material prices is good for Alcoa. Similar story with Hubble. We discussed this name when we talked about the Biden stocks. More projects, higher copper prices, higher commodity prices, Hubble can comfortably increase prices, charging customers more. Not to mention that the increase in economic activities due to inflation will mean more projects for the name. And lastly, we have John Deere. The rise in grain prices and the pent-up demand that is about to be released in the economy will lead to more inflation and higher and higher grains prices. Farmers will be incentivized to produce more to capture the high prices of grains well, they need tractors. They need to upgrade their equipments. John Deere benefits tremendously. What about the names that will get hurt from higher inflation? We're talking about high priced names in terms of valuations. Those will be cut due to the rise of treasury yields. Furthermore, we're looking for businesses that cannot pass the extra cost of raw materials and input prices to the end customer due to the competition. In addition, we're looking for names that traditionally compete with treasury yields, such as utility names. If we have the risk-free rate rising higher, what purpose do utility stocks serve in our portfolios? And here is the list. Verizon, this is a utility name, a yield name that will become less and less attractive as we see the risk-free rate rising higher. What about American Airlines? The high input prices of oil will damage the recovery in American Airlines. They have to stay competitive. They cannot pass the extra cost to the end customer. They can pass some of it, but the damage will not be escaped completely. Duke Energy, this is a utility name. We discussed that. What about home builders such as DR Horton? As inflation rises higher, mortgage rates will also rise higher. And thus the demand for home purchasing and buying will plummet. DR Horton gets hurt as a result. Snapchat, Okta, Zoom, Nvidia, all very high priced names, high valuations. Those will have to be cut because the risk-free rate is surging higher. Similar story with Peloton. Peloton is selling overpriced bikes made in China. Now, a lot of their customers are financing the bike. Higher interest rates will mean that the financing cost to purchase a Peloton bike will rise higher and thus the demand will plummet. Not to mention the reopening of the economy, etc., etc. And the fact that the name is very overvalued. Similar story with Shopify, Square, DoorDash, DocuSign, ServiceNow. All of these names are good businesses, but they are severely overvalued. Those valuations will be cut as we see inflation rising higher. What about General Motors and Tesla? High input prices that cannot be passed to the end customer. Why? Because they have to remain competitive. Specifically Tesla, they have to compete with Chinese cars. They cannot pass the extra cost to the end customer. They have to eat it. Not to mention the rise in financing costs. The interest rates will go higher and that will make financing new cars less and less attractive. Let's discuss the second theme here, the US dollar prices. What determines the US dollar prices? Oil prices, and you can argue the chicken or the egg in this situation. However, oil is not pinned up to gold anymore. It's pinned up to oil 
itself. Any manipulation, say by OPEC and the likes, that will add downward pressure on the US dollar. You're seeing oil prices going higher even though the demand has not recovered yet. But it's all about expectations here. The Biden administration will decrease the domestic production of oil and gas. That in itself helps oil prices to rise higher adding more pressure on the US dollar. And of course, we have supply and demand, just like any currency. We have the money supply. We discussed that. More supply, the tsunami that the Federal Reserve has ushered, that will add downward pressure on the currency. And then we have other forms of manipulation. That could be via the Fed using swap facilities or via other countries manipulating their own currencies and thus impacting the value of the US dollar. The trajectory here is that the US dollar will decline over time. So which stocks are going to benefit from the decline of the US dollar? Look for names that are giant industrial exporters from the United States because as the value of the US dollar plummets, it becomes more attractive to buy US goods. Say you live in Australia and the US dollar declines in value. Your Australian dollar can buy more American goods when you convert the currency that you have to the US dollar. So you will see American businesses that export a lot of stuff to Australia benefiting significantly. Likewise, we're looking for multinational companies that do a lot of business overseas, say in Europe. If the euro rises and the dollar plummets, all the revenue that these businesses earn overseas will have to be converted back to the US dollar. And when you have, for example, a higher euro and you convert a higher euro to a lower US dollar, all of a sudden now you have a larger revenue. The exchange rate is very critical to companies' earnings. So with that being said, here is the list. McDonald's doing a lot of business overseas. So does Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Mondelez, Philip Morris, the majority of the revenue comes from overseas. Smoking is declining in America because we're smoking weed now. We're not smoking tobacco. But tobacco smoking is still popular overseas. So all of the revenue that Philip Morris will capture overseas will be translated to higher revenue, higher earnings for the company. Ford, a large exporter. Similar story with John Deere, Caterpillar, 3M, Exxon. The lower the US dollar dives, the higher oil prices will go. Apple doing a lot of business overseas. Netflix, we covered the earnings for Netflix and Netflix is having for the first time ever positive cash flow thanks to the exchange rate effect. IBM, a very large contractor overseas, perhaps the exchange rate will help their declining business and revive it. Intel, similar story. Merck, massive amount of revenue generated from overseas, similar story with Facebook, Qualcomm, Broadcom, Marriott, Johnson & Johnson, Freeport McMoran, the lower the dollar, the higher the prices of copper, international paper, one of the largest exporters from the United States. What about Brown and Foreman? The lower the US dollar, the higher the demand for American whiskey in Europe and other territories. That goes on for Budweiser and for Boeing. It's an opportunity of a lifetime if you see a decline in the US dollar to start buying and placing orders for Boeing planes if you are a foreign airlines operator. What about the names that will be hurt from the decline of the US dollar? Look for names that generate the majority of the revenue domestically, but they rely on imports. They're net importers of goods. Also look for international companies that generate a lot of revenue from the United States. Because if you're generating your revenue from America and the US dollar is lower, you have to exchange those dollars, those weaker dollars, to your higher currency, say the euro, and that will have a negative exchange rate. So we're looking for names like Home Depot, Walmart, even though a big name like Walmart is perfectly hedged. It will only get hurt if we see a very sharp and sudden decline for the US dollar. The majority of goods sold by Walmart are manufactured overseas, particularly in China. The weaker dollar will have less purchasing power against a strengthening currency. Similar story for Dollar Tree, and they cannot pass the cost to the end customer. They have to eat it up. The negative exchange rate will hurt a name like Dollar Tree. Similar story with Costco, Samsung, LG, Canon, Sony. All of these are Asian brands that do a lot of business in the US. They will have 
to eat the exchange rate negatively. Macy's, a lot of goods from overseas, they will have less purchasing power, they will have to spend more, their goods are going to cost more, and that would dwindle the demand that goes for Target, similar story. What about Expedia? With a lower dollar, traveling overseas will become more and more expensive. Thus, a lot of travelers will prefer spending vacations domestically. Even though for overseas travelers, say travelers from Europe, it will become more attractive to travel to the US and vacation over here. Yet the bulk of revenues for Expedia come from the American traveler, not the overseas traveler. Unilever, Nestle, all of those are European brands that do a lot of business here in America and they will have to suffer the negative exchange rate. Understand the majority of these businesses are perfectly hedged. But what if we have a sudden collapse in the value of the US dollar? In that scenario, these businesses will suffer tremendously. Moving on, starting with the SPY, 15 minutes chart. We continue to gap higher and higher and higher without closing any of these gaps. We saw the similar phenomena happening back in August 2020, and I called this the blow off top rally. It kind of started back in November, and we still have gaps and fill from November post-elections. Those will be filled at some point when we have a correction. And let me illustrate that for you by visiting the daily chart of the SPY. Suppose we have a correction tomorrow, all the way back to the white trend line. That would be about 10% or so, and we will close the majority of the gaps we left open during the rally. But remember, typical correction range from 10 to 20%, meaning that the SPY can go a lot higher before we face the correction all the way back to the wide trend line you see on the chart. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract? Once again, the blow off top, we have broken above the resistance level of 3,862, and now the sky is the limit. We still have a negative divergence in the RSI, but that could be fixed as soon as tomorrow. Understand, that these impulsive rallies are not very healthy. We saw that last back in August 2020, and we know how that movie ended, meaning that you have to be very careful here participating in this rally. But the purpose of blow-off top rallies is to suck as many investors and traders to lock them in the trap before having the correction. What about the cues? 15 minutes chart. We had a gap higher in the morning, but from a technical standpoint, we managed to go down and close that gap and then trading higher. That is a very bullish signal. We still have the gap from last week unfilled. We will fill that during the correction. What about the daily chart of the continuous contract? We're closing above the very important resistance line, 13,599. It now acts as support. And let me illustrate that for you by visiting the 15 minutes chart. You see the retest, checking for support. Support is okay. Now we march higher. This is very bullish behavior from the queues. Shifting to the IWM. What do we see here? The impulsive rally goes on and on and on. And we continue to leave gaps as we go higher overnight. Those gaps will be filled. We just don't know when. And playing that guessing game of timing, the top can be very, very painful. The problem is with the IWM that in a few days, we've already rallied over 10% and we're back at the very elevated level of 74 in the RSI. Take a look at the volume. This is an autopilot institutional purchasing of the IWM overnight and throughout the day. We talked about the stupidity of the retail trader going all in Naruto style with their blindfold heads first. Now we're talking about institutionals being dumb as well, going heads first Naruto style, the blindfold is still on, buying the IWM. It's not their money they're gambling with. The IWM remains the most dangerous chart in the stock market. And everybody wants to time the correction. If you're right, you're going to have a massive, massive profit. If you're wrong, make sure to use stop loss orders always. Because if you're wrong, you're going to get slaughtered. What about the dollar index? The ABC pattern is pretty much done. And we could head lower to the support of 90 and a half if the dollar index wants to. But remember, what's dictating the movement in the US dollar is the flow of news regarding the stimulus. The longer we see the Democrats and Republicans not coming up to an agreement, the higher the probability will be 
that the Democrats will go at it alone and pass the bill and they're going to use their bill, the high stimulus bill, which will add pressure on what? On the U.S. dollar. What about gold? A down day for the U.S. dollar? That means a higher day for gold. Once again, the level of 1830 happens to be the highs of the reversal candle, the breakdown from the bear flag. That will act as a resistance at least in the short term. But remember, just like we discussed with the U.S. dollar, gold will be very volatile depending on the flow of news regarding stimulus. So if you are making big bets one way or the other against gold you could get slaughtered because it's going to be very very volatile what about the 10-year treasury yield the abc pattern is still going on we saw yields rising higher in the morning 1.2 percent however closing at around 1.17 what about the vix the massive decline goes on even though the VIX managed to close in the green today but we cannot read anything looking at the VIX chart itself we have to look at the VXX. Are we seeing the retest of the descending line for support and then bouncing higher? It is inconclusive right now. It's not definitive. We're trading below it just slightly. We're looking for a decisive crossing one way or the other. But one thing to keep in mind here, check out the chart of the VIXM. This is the midterm volatility index and it is trading pretty much closer to the highs. It is looking more bullish than the actual VIX. So are traders still seeing an uptick in volatility in the medium term, perhaps in the short term, we will have the blow off top rally in the stock market. However, there is a correction looming in the horizon. What about Apple? No update whatsoever until we close above the level of 138. Absent of that, the bear flag is still intact. Closing above 138, we know it is another higher low and we will look for all time highs what about tesla surprising reaction somehow it stayed muted even though we had big news regarding tesla buying bitcoin but the excitement was in bitcoin itself it did not spill over to tesla shares are we seeing delayed reaction here are we gonna see tesla reacting higher tomorrow who knows because we could see the opposite of investors being very concerned about the latest move from Elon Musk. We're still in indecision land here, waiting and waiting and waiting for what? An uptick in options volumes. And that uptick has to be sustainable. We can't have it for Friday and then options go down again the next week. We need to see significant options buying activities to determine if Tesla has another leg in the rally. You have to remember that a lot of retail investors are holding the back in GameStop, AMC, etc. So they don't have the money to participate in another leg higher for Tesla. The question is, how will we digest the Bitcoin news? That will determine the next move for Tesla, along with the options volume. And now, let's move on to conclude this video. Let's review the current threats for the market. Number one, higher taxes. We know that we have a massive budget deficit. And according to the Congressional Budget Office, they have a lot of suggestions. You can read them for yourself from cutting costs, etc. But the most effective remedy will be increasing revenues because spending will have to stay constant to revive the economy. So you will need more revenue. That revenue will come from higher taxes. Higher taxes will hurt corporate earnings. It is a threat that has been brushed off right now. Nobody's paying attention to it whatsoever, but it will become more relevant as we get deeper into the Biden presidency. Inflation, we talked in depth about inflation. It is, perhaps for now, the biggest risk to this rally. Higher yields, that will come hand in hand with inflation. And what happens when we have higher yields and higher interest rates? Remember that we have a lot of zombie companies in the stock market right now. We have highly leveraged companies, even among the largest companies in the world. Higher interest rates will add more pressure on their ability to service the debt. We will see a lot of bankruptcies and we will see that the interest expense corporations are paying resulting in reduced margins, meaning that corporate earnings will plummet 
not go higher as the current mania market is assuming. Number five, we have excessive valuations. That is self-explanatory. We talked about the highest PE ratio on record, the highest forward PE ratio on record for the market. Those excessive valuations are a threat. And the last threat here is the black swan event. What if we have a new COVID variant that is resistant? to the current vaccines. That will mean we have to go back to square one, more stimulus, more work in vaccines, and this time around, the market will be very exhausted, the high levels of debt will not be sustainable. And if that is the case, and the black swan event will come out of the blue, you will not just see a disaster in the stock market, we will see a massive disaster in the global economy. We don't wanna see that. We have to stay vigilant regarding a threat from a new variant that takes us all the way back to square one. And before I leave you, the level of mania in the stock market has exceeded euphoria. We are beyond euphoria and beyond arrogance. I'm starting to hear and feel, even from the perma bulls, they're starting to get worried. These are rational investors, by the way, that happens to be perma bulls. But even they are worried right now and asking the question, is this really realistic? For stocks to blast higher every single day impulsively, they're starting to get worried. Meanwhile, the zombie part of market participants, those are the zombies high on meth looking for the next score, looking for stocks to go to the moon. They're getting more emboldened, more stupid, taking more risk by the day. So are we in the delusion part of the cycle? We're certainly beyond the media attention. We're beyond enthusiasm. We're beyond greed. So are we at the delusion stage that will morph into the new paradigm when everybody assumes that this is the new normal for the stock market, valuations will remain elevated forever, and this is how the stock market will perform from this point on because fill in the blank reason. Where are we right now? I believe that we are slowly moving from delusion to the new paradigm. I heard a guest on CNBC talking about the highest PE ratio on record as the new normal. So perhaps we're already at the new paradigm. This is my opinion, of course. I'd like to hear from you. Let me know in the comments, where do you think we are right now in the cycle? That's all I got for you for this video. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.